I never took it away. Trapped as a sex worker. Just a prostitute that no one cares about. And beaten into submission. And that's when I just knew. I said, I can't protect myself. I can't. A victim of trafficking speaks up. There was no way out. And shares how she got free on today's 700 Club. It's a purpose behind my story. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. You know, it's been a crazy week, hasn't it? I mean, you know, we thought that the health care bill was going to pass because the Republicans control the House. But lo and behold, a group called the Freedom Caucus said, no way, we're going to bomb it out. And so they did. Did they do the Trump a favor or did they hurt him badly? Is he wounded for the future or is it a good thing the Democrats now own the health care situation 100 percent? Well, in any event, Republicans are uh, say they're not giving up. They're going to move ahead with the rest of the president's agenda, including tax cuts. Republicans are also going back to the drawing board to come up with a new health care plan and repeal and replace Obamacare. Abigail Robertson brings us the story from Capitol Hill. GOP members of Congress went back to their districts frustrated over the weekend after failing to take the first steps towards dismantling Obamacare. This is a disappointing day for us. Doing big things is hard. All of us. All of us, myself included, we will need time to reflect on how we got to this moment, what we could have done to do it better. In a crushing defeat for House leadership, Speaker Ryan was forced to cancel the highly anticipated vote on the American Health Care Act after not getting enough support to pass the bill from his Republican colleagues. But there were signs of trouble even before the bill was released with Senator Rand Paul and members of the conservative House Freedom Caucus, like Congressman Louie Gohmert, voicing disappointment the plan was crafted behind closed doors and not in a more inclusive discussion with a variety of GOP lawmakers. We have got to do something, but now instead of having listening sec sections and then going behind closed doors and then saying, here's the bill, you got to vote for it, we're not going to change anything, take it or leave it, but you can't leave it, everybody's got to vote for it. This time I'd like to see us get together with it. There's some great people in, in our Republican caucus, terrific, brilliant. We can come to an agreement. Freedom Caucus members wanted to see a clean repeal of Obamacare and were concerned the new plan did not do enough to drive down the cost of premiums for the American people. Gohmert told CBN News he thought the bill left too much power over the health care system with Washington. I don't think the, the cure for the disaster of Obamacare is more federal control, more power in the bureaucracy. Gohmert says he's ready to get to work with the GOP conference to craft a new health care plan. We're going to start on that next week because health care is so personal. It, it's people's lives and uh, we've got to we got to help. President Trump took to Twitter over the weekend, blaming the conservative group for saving Obamacare, saying Democrats are smiling in D.C. that the Freedom Caucus, with the help of Club for Growth and Heritage, have saved Planned Parenthood and O'Care. Democrats like Nancy Pelosi are ecstatic that for now Obamacare remains the law of the land. But Freedom Caucus Chair Mark Meadows says this is just the negotiation process and they are still committed to helping President Trump deliver on his promise of repealing and replacing Obamacare. I can tell you that uh, conversations over the last 48 hours are really about how we come together uh, in the Republican con uh, conference and, and try to get this over the finish line. Meadows also disagreed with those questioning Speaker Ryan's leadership abilities. I can tell you there is no conversations going on right now with regards to replacing the speaker. It's all hands on deck with regards to Obamacare, tax reform, the border wall. And Freedom Caucus member Trent Franks of Arizona told CBN News that despite the setback, the Republicans aren't giving up. I'm convinced that uh, the president did not fail the country here. Unfortunately, the Congress failed the president. And I hope that somehow we will go back and, and understand where we went wrong and do better this next time. Many members of the Freedom Caucus are vocal supporters of President Trump, who says he's learned a lot from the health care defeat, 
but is ready to move on and focus on the future. We all learned a lot. We learned a lot about loyalty. We learned a lot about uh, the vote-getting process. We learned a lot about some very arcane rules in, obviously, both the Senate and in the House. Uh, so it's been, certainly for me, it's been a very interesting experience. But in the end, I think it's going to be an experience that leads to an even better health care plan. Speaker Ryan says Republicans are going to move forward with the rest of their agenda, securing the border, rebuilding the military, and tax reform. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. Uh, with us now is David Brody. Uh, David, you know, there's some people who think that that what they were doing was just uh, fixing Obamacare around the edges and it's still going to collapse. And when it collapses at this point, the Democrats own it 100 percent. So really, they may have been doing Trump a favor. What do you think? Well, Pat, I think part of the problem here is that they, a lot of folks were calling it Obamacare light. They really weren't repealing the whole bill. I, I know there was going to be a phase two and a phase three, but they weren't repealing the whole bill. Uh, and so uh, the last time I checked in politics, uh, replacing a bad law with a bad bill makes bad politics. It, it's really that simple. And here's the problem for the president. Uh, Donald Trump wanted the Freedom Caucus to have his back. But the problem is, is that the constituents in the Freedom Caucus's districts, in other words, those that voted for Trump, realized this was not a good bill. So they didn't have Trump's back. I mean, look, if this was a good bill, they would have called the Freedom Caucus members and said, come on, folks, get with the program and vote for it. But they didn't do that because it wasn't a good bill to begin with. And I think that's the inherent problem here. Well, David, you know, that deal that's there, the Obamacare, is going to collapse. I mean, the, the exchanges are collapsing. The health uh, companies are going out of business. And uh, so, and the premiums are rising dramatically. I mean, this is going to be a disaster within a few months from now. Well, it's heading that way. The problem for President Trump is that he says he's going to wait for that to happen and then Democrats will come begging to him to change it. I'm not holding my breath, Pat, that Democrats are going to be coming to President Trump saying, please, we're ready to make a deal now, uh, even if it goes south. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen just politically. It's too partisan in Washington for that to happen. And so, you know, where does that leave us? It leaves us with President Trump trying to figure this thing out. Does he go with moderate Democrats, whether it be on health care or tax reform uh, going forward? forward? Does he try to work again with the Freedom Caucus? He's going to need them as well. Uh, he's going to have to choose here because he may have to jettison the Freedom Caucus and go with moderate Democrats to see if he can get something done. The problem is, Pat, no moderate Democrats probably going to want to work with Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he's got that problem. And then with the Freedom Caucus, they're willing to work with him. But Trump's got to deliver something better than what they did on health care. You suppose he's going to pivot and forget health care for a while. I think that's probably what he'd do and pick up taxes. Yeah, he's going to pivot away from health care for now. It's the dot, dot, dot for now. And the Freedom Caucus members uh, are going to go ahead and work on some sort of uh, plan that they think will be palatable to Speaker Ryan and to some of the moderates and to, and to the president himself. And then it's on to tax reform as, it's, as we speak now. But uh, look, tax reform is going to be, I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting because tax reform is really Trump's bread and butter. And why they didn't start with that over health care reform uh, has a lot of folks up here scratching their head. One of the reasons they thought was that if you, you do got to do health care reform and fix some of that tax structure before you can go to, to the larger tax structure problem. But it just seems to me like Trump was playing an away game all along, to use a baseball term, and, and really he needed to probably play that home game, which is tax reform. They're going into his wheelhouse now, so this should be different. We'll see. Have you got any framework of the current tax bill? I, I, we've talked to the head of the Ways and Means mm -hmm. Committee. His bill is fantastic if they put it through. Is that what they're going to support, do you think? Yeah, I think it'll be something along these, those lines. I also think that, remember, we're looking at, obviously, corporate rates uh, coming way down under Trump. I believe it was at 15 percent is what he wanted. It might be 20. I'll have to double check that. Between 15 and 20 for sure. But I can tell you this, Pat, uh, this administration understands one of the lessons learned here, which is they've got to push this. Uh, the president has to be very articulate in terms of what he wants on, in a bill. It wasn't that way with health care. He didn't sell it as much as he could have. Uh, and so on tax reform, they're going to take the uh, initiative here, and then the president's going to sell it a lot more than he did health care. David, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, we watch eagerly, but I do think the American people want something, and it's really tough to be in the hot seat like President Trump is with uh, really, he had no 
party. <clears throat> he ran essentially as an outsider. And uh, he's relied on Paul Ryan to bring that other thing to the head and to get the bill that was necessary. And now he's got taxes, and he has a good economic team. Steve Mnuchin uh, can probably put something together. So we'll watch that uh, eagerly. But that's, as was said, that's his wheelhouse. Terry? Well, up next, there are Christians who left their lives behind and moved halfway around the world. This is in South Georgia, and uh, I just thought, okay, God, I'm being called to the Asian people, and I, I love it. I absolutely love it here. See how they're spreading Christ among a Buddhist nation when we return. Well, we're starting the week off. We're glad to have all of you with us. For most people, traveling is a way to take a break from their everyday lives. For some people, it can change their life. That's what happened to one American couple when their once-in-a-lifetime vacation turned into a lifelong calling. Gary Lane has this. Near the Yangtze River is a small island nation enriched by unique culture and people. Emperor's treasures and tradition make Taiwan an attractive tourist spot. <laughs> Buddhism and Taoism are the major religions of Taiwan. Many millennials believe those gods can provide them with inner peace and guaranteed success at work and home. Most of the people go to temple, they look for good luck and fortune. Temples in Taiwan are full of magical charms, fascinating designs, and traditional symbols. Churches are hard to be found in the northeast region of the island, where Christianity is nearly non-existent. Of Taiwan's 23 million people, 6% are Christians. More than 28% follow Buddhism. Less than 3% claim no religion at all. Now let's have a, have a sure. mini prayer. These American Christians are on the move. Their mission? Introducing the Taiwanese to Christ. Richard Roberts and his wife Jessie moved to Taiwan from America's Georgia. During their first trip in 2004, they found out that some people had never heard of Jesus. They don't have a lot of information on, on Christ and how Christ is that Savior and can be their salvation. Then, after some research, they made a big decision, planting churches for Jesus. And share the gospel in, their, in a home setting, in a school setting, in a library setting or whatever kind of setting they can find in a park or wherever, to just share the gospel, let people see Jesus in them. <laughs> Roberts familiarized himself with the local people, telling them about Jesus. He and a team of American Christians traveled from one place to another to recruit more helpers. They can teach English, they can share the gospel, they can share their faith, they can become uh, good friends with uh, some of the local kids and teenagers that there. And then, of course, our hope is that that when that friendship is built, that, that they will start bringing them to the churches that we are also planting at the same time. Richard's daughter is excited to serve Jesus in Taiwan. I just felt like I, I was so happy and grateful to my parents that they moved us here to become missionaries because I felt like, you know, um, I got to, I basically, I got to wake up, you know, every day and anticipate like different things that God was doing in our lives. Gradually, younger Taiwanese are experiencing church. For many of them, Jesus only belongs to the West. Over time, the church began to develop bigger goals. They recruited students from colleges and universities. American students were inspired by the Roberts story. Some Americans have left their homes and assist in the mission. They believe the Lord put them in the ministry for a special purpose. God gave me a dream of me riding a bike in Taiwan. So I uh, came on over to Taiwan. Figured I'd be kind of silly not to. In addition, the staff understands this is an opportune time for Taiwanese to hear about Christ. Gospel is really important here because the people are lost. It's really hurtful to see people trying to be good, thinking they're going to get to heaven, but in the end, they may not. In the long run, besides their hard work and dedication, Roberts and the team believe prayer will change the lives of millions in Taiwan. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, that's interesting. It's an open mission field, if you can use that. I mean, we were there a few years ago broadcasting. It was absolutely free and open for us. And 
Uh, Chiang Kai-shek was uh, in charge of that Taiwan when they moved over from China. And uh, uh, Madam Chiang, they were Christians. And so uh, at least the leadership of Taiwan, so I, I'm surprised that it has swung so strongly toward Buddhism. Okay, what's next? Well, coming up, she thought she found her Prince Charming. He wound up becoming her pimp. He would tell me, if you leave me, I'm gonna find you and I'm gonna kill you. Hear how one woman got sucked into the world of sex trafficking and how she made her way out. That's next. Can slavery still be happening in America? Can people actually be bought and sold and traded and treated as nothing more than a piece of property? Well, Leah Rogers was just that. Her pimp owned her, and he forced Leah to dress a certain way, talk a certain way, even move and act a certain way. And if Leah resisted, she was savagely beaten. How did she get her life back? Here's her story. I was afraid. I was so skinny, so unhealthy. I felt like people think I'm just nasty, that I'm just a prostitute, that no one cares about me. Leah Rogers was a victim of sex trafficking. I did try to escape several times, and I never could get away. And the abuse, the hits, became harder and harder to a point where I blacked out a couple times with the hits. And then that's when I just knew. I said, I can't protect myself. I can't, I can't fight him. Leah had been an easy target. Born out of wedlock, she grew up with her drug addicted mother. The only father figures she knew were the men in her mother's life who at times beat and molested Leah. So that's what I thought, you know, love was. That's what I thought attention from a man was. It was normal to me. Leah was 13 when Child Protective Services put her into a group home where she spent five troubled years. By the time she aged out at 18, she had a one-year-old daughter. With no money and nowhere to turn, she took a job as an exotic dancer. The only thing that I knew is that guys liked me for one thing, and that was my body. I was like, you know, hey, guys have touched me my whole life. What's the big deal? For the next six years, she made her living as a stripper. One night, she met a man at the club she thought was her Prince Charming. Honestly, he was so sweet. He would shower me with gifts. He knew how to say all the right things. He always made me feel wanted. But after a few dates, he became possessive and eventually took her phone and IDs. When Leah resisted, he exploded. Started hitting me several times in my face um, where both my eyes were so swollen and black that I couldn't even see out of them. And pulled out all my hair, like skin bald. Um, he started to burn me with cigarettes all down my arms and my legs. He made me feel like if you didn't do that, then you wouldn't get beat. If you just listen, then you wouldn't get hit. After months of brainwashing and abuse, Leah gave up fighting. He branded her with a tattoo as his property and forced her into prostitution, something he had planned all along. He would tell me, if you leave me, I'm gonna find you and I'm gonna kill you. If I can't find you, I'm gonna kill your, your mother. To protect her daughter and her mother, who was now clean and a Christian, Leah stayed. She sent her daughter to live with her brother. For the next three years, her captor dragged her across the Southwest, while at the same time recruiting other girls. Then Leah became pregnant with his son, and his grip tightened. But the abuse continued after that, and um, he was still making me work. I felt like I was trapped. There was no way out. Two weeks after I had my son, he took him to his mom's house. I wasn't allowed to see my son unless it was with supervision. Wasn't allowed to take him nowhere. And he would use that against me. Then in 2011, one of Leah's Johns pulled a gun and threatened to kill her. She convinced him to let her live, 
but the trauma left her more desperate for escape. Leah cried out to a God she barely knew. My God, if you're real, please help me. Please help me. Like, just crying. I said, I don't know how to escape. I don't know how to leave. But I need your help. Save me. Save me. Two weeks later, Leah was with her pimp as he was trying to recruit two girls. They turned out to be undercover cops and took both of them into custody. Afraid of what might happen to her son, Leah said nothing in her defense. As a result, she was charged with 21 felonies, the same as the trafficker who had been holding her hostage. I was just screaming and crying. I was mad at God. But while awaiting trial in jail, Leah continued talking to God and began reading the Bible and attending chapel. I started to wake up early in the morning, like at five in the morning, when, before the whole dorm woke up. And I started to pray and sing aloud. The feeling that I had when I talked to him, when I read the word, like it was something that no one's ever gave me. The love that I felt from God was a love that I felt from no human being to this day. Leah had been in jail for six months when she gave her life to Christ. All the hurt, all the anger, all the pain, all the scars, all the suffering was his. I started to trust him. I knew that whatever happened, he knew what was best for me, and he was protecting me. He was my father, and he loved me. And I believed that with all my heart. Still concerned for her son, Leah kept silent and signed a plea deal for a seven-year sentence. Then a week later, she received a postcard. It was from her trafficker's family, and on the back was written, I have your son. She called her mother, who went immediately to pick him up. Once he was safe, Leah showed the postcard to her lawyer and agreed to testify. Using the postcard as evidence, her lawyer appealed her case, and the judge dropped all charges. My lawyer came up to me and he said, are you ready to go home? And I just started crying. <laughs> the only God, after you sign a plea for seven years, can make the judge turn his heart around and say, no, we're giving this girl a chance. You know, that, that had to be him. After completing a court-ordered rehabilitation program, Leah was reunited with her children. Today, she's an educator with the Sex Trafficking Institute and runs the Help Her Stand Foundation, an organization that counsels and advocates for sex trafficking victims. That means everything because it means what I went through was not in vain. It's a purpose behind my story. Now I'm free. Now, now I can talk and I can tell my story and I'm not scared because I have someone that's gonna protect me that's better than any human, which is God. The human spirit, how resilient they are, how resilient we are as humans. Just think of Leah, suffering, beaten, hopeless, but she still had inside of her that one spark that comes from God himself. And that spark reached out to God and a flame emerged. And she became a child of God. Listen, some of you right now, you may be having the same problem. You may have been sexually abused. You may have been beaten. You may have been uh, rejected. Your parents may have cast you out. You may be homeless. You may have been the victim of a divorce. You may have an abusive spouse. Whatever. God loves you. And God will deliver you if you call upon him. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can ask or think. He's all-powerful. So I want you right now, just like Leah did, you call on the Lord and watch what he'll do. These words, pray with me. Jesus, that's right, Jesus. You know my situation. You know the hurt. You know the pain. God, help me. Help me. I cry to you, Lord. I cry to you. Help me. Come into my heart. I give you my life. I give you my heart. And Lord, from this moment on, I am yours. And I receive your deliverance. 
Now, Lord, move in my behalf and set me free from sin and from bondage that I might serve you from this moment on. I'm yours, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. If you prayed with me, go to your phones, tell somebody they want to hear it. And I want to give you something. It's called a new day. You know, some of you say, is there no hope? Well, the answer is yes, there's hope. And you've come to the Lord. And this tells you what you've done and how you can start a new day. I'll give it to you free, but Call anyhow. There's, there's no, no money involved. The toll-free call. Talk to somebody and just tell them I'm free. And if you need help, somebody's on the phone going to help you. 1-800-759-0700. And actually, we've got a new number. It's 1-800-700-7000. That's easy to remember. I was giving you the old number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Somebody's here who loves you. Terry? Well, still ahead, there are future lawyers who are trying to end human trafficking and at the same time fighting for the rights of the unborn. They'll share their stories when we come back. Welcome to Washington for this CBN News Break. Around 18,000 more people are in Washington this week for the American Israel Public Affairs Committee Conference, or APAC. It gives pro-Israel supporters a chance to hear from politicians who make decisions directly impacting relations between the U.S. and Israel. Vice President Mike Pence kicked off the conference, highlighting how the Trump administration has already shown its support for Israel. For the first time in a long time, America has a president who will stand with our allies and stand up to our enemies. The United States will no longer allow the United Nations to be used as a forum for invective against Israel or the West. The conference continues through tomorrow with speeches from United Nations Ambassador Nikki Haley, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, and House Speaker Paul Ryan. Well, Orphan's Promise is partnering with Superbook to reach children in Cuba with the gospel message. After the recent warming of U.S.-Cuba relations, Orphan's Promise began operating on the island last year. It has reached more than 13,000 kids in that time, and 1,400 of them have accepted Jesus Christ. Children who attend the events receive school supplies, Superbook DVDs, and a warm meal. They also receive Christian mentorship and get connected to a local church. This year's Gizmo Tour is hoping to launch 200 more academies and Superbook clubs that will reach 30,000 Cuban children in 2017. Well, if you'd like to learn more about what CBN is doing around the world, simply go to cbn.com international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. of Regent University is Christian leadership to change the world. At the Law School Center for Global Justice, students are doing just that. They've logged thousands of hours defending the poor and the needy and giving a voice to those who have none. Take a look. Towards the end of my trip in India, I was able to go on a raid we're driving there, it's raining, and turn a corner and you just see all these girls. But there were these two girls, and like one girl, you know, she had an attitude and didn't want to talk at all. And the other girl, like she, there was just this innocence to her. And oh man, and she reminded me of someone I knew. And so it was just like, oh my goodness, you look, it's so scary because you look like someone I know. We didn't think the very first day when we'd walk in, we were gonna get slapped down with a, not even partial birth abortion, but after birth abortion. The bill was handed straight to us, and they said, look, there's cases going on in Europe. We have testimonies of people who have killed babies after an abortion. The first time we're bringing this up in Parliament is in two weeks, so get this together. 
It was a baptism by fire, to say the least. They threw us in and, and said, here you go, get ready to roll. So our first week there, we were drafting a petition to the Council of Europe uh, almost immediately, which was a pretty fantastic introduction to European law and the study of European law. We were doing really important work, uh, particularly on uh, infants who were born alive from an attempted abortion. A lot of times in Europe, those infants are uh, either left to die or are actually killed. I work with institutionalized children and um, basically implemented an educational program in one of the orphanages. Once you're there and you see the poverty and the, and the hopelessness so many people live in it, it just marks you forever. It's like gives you a stamp on, on, on your heart and you'll never forget it. Those images of the children, the women and the men will stay with you for the rest of your life. And I found that the best way is to empower them through education by placing Christian tutors in government orphanages. It has been probably the biggest, the, the biggest blessing of my life, really, to get to know these children, to get to um, help them. And I think it helped me more than I helped them. Jesus says it's better to give than to receive. And I really found that to be true. There are girls waiting to be rescued. I mean, these girls were in India, but there are girls waiting to be rescued all over the world, including in America. And as Americans, we tend to forget, like, this is happening in our backyard. This is a really serious issue. And like, if we don't care, these girls are just gonna be subject to this. I at first was in denial. And at first I said, Lord, I just need to push through. This is purely academic and we need to get this done. It was Palmer who first came home. And I looked at him, I said, what's wrong? And he burst into tears. What have we been working on? How is that not gripping you? And that's kind of when the floodgates opened. And we both, we spent the entire night in tears. You know, it helped me realize in this line of work I'm going into, I can't put that stone wall up. I can't just say, this is work. This isn't my life. This isn't spiritual for me. This is, you know, this is real. This program uh, makes possible things that are otherwise not possible. These grants make it possible for us to go do what God has called us to do and there's no better gift you can give somebody than that, than being able to live out what God has in store for them. Well, this whole experience has just given me a purpose in life, and I'm just thankful to God that I, I think I found my purpose in life by working with these children. I know why I'm living, I know why I'm in school, I know how, what I'm gonna do uh, after I finish school. Sometimes you yourself can't get out there directly and do this type of work, but you know, God can use you to help someone else do that, and we should work to further kingdom purposes. If you want to be able to reach India, if you want to be able to reach Africa, if you want to be able to reach the EU and all of these hurting countries who are just begging for our help, this is the way to do it. I thank and I bless every single person who has already given or is even considering giving because it, it, it allows us to, to do God's work, and there's no other way to, to say it. Regent University School Fabulous. of Law. Here are a few things, Terry, interesting. It's been voted one of the best schools for bar exam prep. Uh, 200 and 2015 best school for practical training, uh, national jurist. Uh, the law faculty has been named among the top 10 uh, in the nation by the Princeton Review. Uh, the uh, JD program is fully approved by the American Bar Association and Regent uh, offers programs uh, on campus and online. And there are about 44 sitting judges right now who are Regent Law graduates. You know, one of the things yeah. that struck me that one of the young men in that piece said, um, a lot of kids go to college and they, they choose a major and something yeah. they think they want to do. But one of the things that you hear from Regent students is God helps them define what That's their right. calling is and what they're supposed to do so that those two things match up, the calling well, and the academic pursuit. Exactly. Well, it's the whole theme of Regent is Christian leadership to change the world. And mm -hmm. they, they're engaged in 
you know, we have about 12 or so uh, college presidents who are graduates. Uh, we have uh, maybe 375 faculty members in various prestigious universities who are graduates. Uh, 800 teachers of the year uh, graduates. We have 400 film awards. You can go down the list. These people are really doing a good job. But if you are interested, the number is still available. We're still, uh, Regent is still uh, enrolling students. And you can enroll eight times a year. It's not just two semesters. It's eight times a year where there's a break. So, uh, and it's, it's not just law. There are other, of course, other disciplines that uh, doctorate in psychology, for example. There are all kinds of, mm -hmm. now it's cybersecurity. Now it's a, a Bachelor of Science in Nursing that's very popular. We've got uh, uh, analytics. We've got all kinds of sophisticated programs available for you. So it's an amazing school. It's the fastest growing university in America, I might add, which is kind of nice. Check it out. No? Check it out. Check it out. All right. <laughs> well, still ahead, we've got your email questions. Lee says, I've been in an emotionally abusive marriage for over 13 years. When things get bad, my husband won't talk about it, and it's starting to take a toll on my physical health. What do I do? We'll have another round of Bring It On. It's coming up, so don't go away. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Lara, her brother, and her mother left behind the only home they'd ever known when they fled the war in Syria. Her dad died in the bombing. Lara's new life in a refugee camp looked bleak until her family received practical help and hope for a better future. Lara and her brother Bilal walk through the tents of this refugee camp in Lebanon every day. They and their mother have struggled to get by on their own ever since the Syrian war engulfed the city of Homs and their father was killed. A large bomb hit our house. My dad and some of my relatives died. I still get really sad when I hear other girls saying, Daddy, Daddy, because I can't say that anymore. We barely made it out of Syria, but life here has been very hard. We came with nothing and we relied on charity of our neighbors to survive. Laura's mother told me one of her biggest worries now is her children's future. It really hurts Lara not being able to go to school. She is such a smart child, and I just wanted her and Bilal to have a chance to do all the things that I could not. So Heart for Lebanon, with support from CBN's Orphan's Promise, invited Lara and Bilal to attend our Hope Center, a school dedicated to educating refugee children. Here, they're learning math, Arabic, English, and music. They're also taught about Jesus Christ. I didn't know about Jesus before coming here. It makes me so happy to know Jesus loves us and is always with us. Jesus is my God and he never lies. So I try to be like him. I like to write and color and play with my friends. And I really like to sing songs about Jesus. At the center, we also show Superbook in Arabic. The show is amazing because we learn stories from the Bible and I get excited learning about God. I go home each day and tell my mom everything I have learned. My kids tell me about Jesus Christ all the time. And when I'm feeling depressed, they say, I should pray. So I do. It feels great. And every month, Heart for Lebanon and Orphans Promise give food to Lara's family and thousands of other refugees. I can thank Heart for Lebanon and Orphans Promise enough for everything they have done for us. The Christians are the ones who have really helped us. I love Heart for Lebanon and Orphans Promise because they are helping us like God teaches us to help others. Dear God, please bless and take care of the orphans of Syria. And please bless the Christians who have opened the school. Dear Lord, please bless them and keep them safe. Amen. Can you see what an amazing opportunity you and I have to step into a place of deep, deep need in the lives of people, to love them, to provide practical help, and then to share with them the love of Jesus. To hear that little girl say, I, I never knew who Jesus was. 
If you're a 700 Club member, you made that possible. We want to say thank you. What we're asking all of you is to care, to care to make a difference in the lives of people in need. A simple way of doing that is by joining the 700 Club. It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. You'll be joining with thousands of us who are out to make that difference in the lives of others. So we welcome you. The number to call is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. A friend on the other end of the line will be thrilled to take your call. One of the ways we want to say thank you to you for caring about others is to send you the secret kingdom. Many of you may remember this was Pat's national bestseller as a book. Well, now we've put it on DVD for you. We want you to understand the principles of God at work in the world around us so that you can walk in the favor and the freedom of that. This is our gift to you, and we'll get it out to you right away when you call and say, I want to join the 700 Club. Amen. Let's bring it on. Let's bring it on. Lay it on okay. me. All right, this what first, do you got? Well, this comes from Lee Pat, who says... I've been in an emotionally abusive marriage for over 13 years. We have three children, and I've continued to stay with my husband because of them. My husband seemed to be following Christ, but over the past few years, he's had affairs and become a very angry person. I've forgiven him for the affairs, and I'm trying to work things out with him. Things get better for a short season, but then quickly revert back to foul language and ugliness. We were pregnant with our first child when we got married, and I really thought he loved me and truly cared for me. I asked forgiveness for my sin and believed getting married was the right thing to do. Please help direct me. My husband won't talk when things get bad and the emotional drain is affecting my physical body. I'm getting closer to 40 and I don't want my life to always be this way. All right, you know, this points out something, Terry, that is so important. Uh, two wrongs don't make a right, you know. So you had sex out of marriage, so you got pregnant. Okay, that was a mistake. So how do you fix it? By getting into a bad marriage? No. And many of you are the same thing. Getting married is not the answer. It may be, it may be the perfect thing to do and it'll lead to happiness and joy and love forever. But that's not the way to fix a, a wrong. That was stake number one. <clears throat> now you've been married for several years. Your husband has cheated on you. He's abusive. He's a nasty so-and-so, and your life is miserable. So what are you to do now? So you made a mistake, then you made a second mistake. How do you fix it? My answer is, according to the Bible, you are free to leave. He's broken it. Adultery is a ground under the teachings that Jesus gave us for, for divorce. You can divorce and remarry, but I definitely would get out of this thing. This guy is, is doing nothing but destroying you. You need to get a lawyer. You need to get the thing done. And he's not going to listen. He's not going to listen, unfortunately. God is on the side, you know, of, of restoration. But you've got people who are in, intractable. So get a lawyer. Get a decree. Get yourself free. Get some maintenance for your children. And get, get free of all this, all right? Okay, this is Joshua who says, I'm trying to fast. Is there a correct way to fast? Do I not eat anything from sunup to sundown, but I can eat after that? Um, again, you know, God isn't a Philadelphia lawyer and he isn't an accountant. He, he just, they, there aren't a whole bunch of precise little rules. You follow this and you're happy and you don't follow this and you're miserable. But the fasting is to, the Bible says, I afflicted my soul that I, I, I may get time with God. So I denied myself my necessary food. Now, there's a fast of no present bread, no dessert, no sweets, etc. over a period of time. That was one kind of fast. Another kind of fast is a complete fast with no food for a number of days. Depends on your condition, your life. It could be a, a fast until three o'clock in the afternoon, you know, whatever. But the question is, you are denying yourself something that is legitimate in order to give yourself time to pray and seek the Lord. That's what it's all about. All this right. is a viewer who says, I've been married for over 10 years and I've been using my paycheck to pay the bills ever since. My husband has had more jobs than the years we've been married and they have all been part-time. I keep asking him to apply for full-time work, but he never does. 
I often work long hours and we tithe off of all my paychecks. I'm feeling run down, burned out, and depressed. Our utilities are cut off often, which never happened before I got married. I've gotten loans and maxed out credit cards in order to survive, yet my husband refuses to look for steady income, and he never has enough in his account to help out when I ask. What can I do? Well, I'll tell you what the Bible says. If any man will not take care of his own, he's worse than an infidel. This guy is worse than an infidel. He has a responsibility. He married you. He has a responsibility to take care of, of, of his uh, expenses plus his share of the marital expenses. And if he won't do it, you, you've got grounds at least to get separation. You, you just can't continue. You know, this idea of, of living with a, a freeloader like that and, and having to carry him that that just isn't the biblical way. If anybody will not look after his own, he's worse than an infidel. All right, next. This is Tyler who says, I've had a crush on this girl in my Bible study. I'm not sure if I should ask her out. I'm pretty sure she likes me too. I do know that I have some trust and jealousy issues and it already makes me uncomfortable that I know she has over 900 followers on Instagram. She talks to a lot of guys and if she were with me, I might have to confront these guys. I've never dated before. Should I pursue her? Wow. You know, I don't know how old you are, but brother, you got a lot to learn. Let me tell you, I mean, growing up, this girl is obviously uh, uh, like a little uh, princess, and she loves attention. She loves it. She's got eight or nine hundred followers on on uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. Instagram, and so forth. You think she's going to be content with a single relationship? With you? she'll be your girlfriend? No way. So if you want to, like a moth drawn to a flame, you want to get burned by all means. But if I were you, I would leave the little princess and go find yourself somebody a little bit less alluring, but one who's a lot more stable in her, her personal life. Get rid of that jealousy issue. <laughs> yeah, you're already jealous and you don't have any claim on her. Are you out of your mind? I mean, come on. She's not yours. She doesn't belong to you. You got no claim on her at all. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Zechariah. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Well, tomorrow we've got the epic story of an American doctor who contracted deadly Ebola virus from facing darkness. You'll find that fascinating, and we'll all see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.